Hi, I'm Ethan. I love muzzleloading. Today we're taking a look at this original Henry Knock Flintlock 4 bore dangerous game rifle. Henry Knock was a highly regarded gun maker active in London from 1772 until his death in 1804. He is best remembered today for his seven barreled volley guns, which were adopted by the Royal Navy, but his skill and innovation as a gun maker extended beyond his work for a board of ordnance in the East India Company to encompass fine firearms for the civilian market. His patent breech of 1787, which detailed a separate hooked breech, which screwed into the breech end of a barrel, was a considerable advancement in the development of the flintlock firearm, the present rifle being an early example dating from 1790 to 1800. The breech of the present rifle is a substantially sized example of Knox patent, with it not only bearing a gold-lined oval maker's mark, marked H. Knock London on the top flat, but also has an HN patent stamped on the lower left flat. The browned swamped Damascus barrel is cut with nine groove rifling and has a silver blade front sight, blued rear sight of one standing and one folding leaf. The underside of the barrel is struck with London proof marks. The lock is flat and beveled with a stepped tail, gold lined rainproof pan, roller and small gold line H knock maker's mark. The rifle is equipped with a single set trigger. The silver wedge extensions are border engraved and the trigger guard has a large pineapple finial. The kind of running joke on the internet is that the 4570 is a gun to hunt Tyrannosaurus rexes with. I would argue that this is what I would want, at least a few of them if I was hunting a Tyrannosaurus Rex. When we look at this piece as a whole, it carries over many of the high quality London and English motifs that we expect from makers like Knock and Manton, but it's really scaled up quite a bit here. This entire piece could be shrunken down and it could be easily mistaken for a small sporting rifle or fouling piece depending on the construction really of the barrel area. But here we have everything enlarged to the max for this dangerous game rifle. Starting at the rear, working forward, we have an iron butt plate. We have a screw back here at the tip and a screw two thirds of the way down. We have a stepped or a curved stepped tang, I should say here that terminates at a point on the crest. We have some simple border engraving that terminates with a nice curl at the top of the tank. We have a beautifully figured buttstock here on either side. Some beautiful almost burling, I would say, through the stock. It's very evident here in the wrist. As much as the stock itself is artistically shaped, it's important to remember that as much of the grain structure as could be seen would be placed strategically in the stock layout so that it would and could be visible. Oftentimes we have any decoration or curl in the stock being reserved for the lock face and back, focusing on the wrist going back so that it could be seen and appreciated, adding to the overall appeal and status of the piece. We have beautiful wrist checkering here and I will note that this checkering is worn down. It's not worn away except for in a couple small spots where a thumb might rest over repeatedly. But we still get some added grip advantage with that checkering. I would want as much aiding the grip on this rifle as I could get. So it's, it's nice to see that fine English checkering carried over to such a large arm. Forward of that, again, we have beautiful texture in the stock. We have an empty wrist extension here. Before we get up to a beautifully English engraved tang here with our engraved tang bolt here at the rear. On the, under, on the underside, we have a fantastically English trigger guard here. We have our pineapple motif prominently here at the front. During the time period and a little bit after, we see the pineapple recognized as a shape or an item in the home of status with some documentation sharing that pineapples would be available for rent so that you could rent a pineapple 
to have in your home during a party or other kind of gathering to elevate possibly your social status. We see that same representation of status uh, in the pineapple motifs on muzzle-loading arms in the period. This is very obviously a high-end piece, so it makes sense that we see a pineapple motif here at the front of the trigger guard. The trigger guard is made of iron. We have beautiful flowing scrolls here through the bow. Back here at the tail of our trigger guard, we do have a worn sunburst pattern here. We have our single trigger and an iron or steel trigger plate on the underneath. While we're talking about the underneath here, we do have quite a bit of wear on the force talk here. At least there's a change in color. When we look at the toe area of the piece back here on the buttstock, it's not an area where we typically see a lot of uh, wear and tear here. We can see a change in color forward in comparison here where a hand would rest carrying or holding this piece. When I see a change in color like that in the forestock, it makes me think that the rifle saw some use or wear in being carried and hunting with over its lifetime. Finishing up on the underside here real quick, we have a massive iron entry pipe here. It has some beautiful file work separating the different areas of our ramrod entry pipe here. I want to note that again, this is a very common design for entry pipes during this period. It is simply scaled up, especially in the diameter of the entry pipe itself. But one area that isn't really scaled up is the length of the tail for our entry pipe here, which I find interesting. We've scaled up in mass around the front of the entry pipe, but we've left our tapering tail about the same length and size as we would see on a more normally sized muzzleloading arm for the period. Forward of that, we have our darkened horn nose cap here at the front of our forestock before transitioning into our Damascus barrel and Damascus under rib. We have one ramrod pipe apart from our entry pipe here at the rear. It is left browned and features two wedding bands on either end and filed facets in the middle. Rotating up to the action end of our barrel, we have a beautiful English lock here. It's a rather large flint lock to accommodate the large arm. I'm glad that we see a large flint lock here. I think a, a smaller lock would look a little out of place on such a large arm. We have a beautiful gold touch hole liner here and a beautiful gold pan as well. Our knock patent breech has been blued in contrast to the brown Damascus barrel we have here. We do have a wide, almost an eighth of an inch wide gold band around our patent breech here that terminates at the vertical barrel flats. In the center or top barrel flat here of our breech, we do have that H knock London stamped and filled with gold. I'll place the lock on half and full cock so that you can hear the satisfying click of this English lock. It's half cock and full cock. It functions as if it is new. Truly beautiful. There's a weight to those springs that is as satisfying as the artistic execution of the piece at, at a whole. Forward of our breech area, we do have our rear sight assembly. This is blued, and we have a nice tail put running forward on this piece. We do have a flip up rear sight fin here to give us a sight picture for a longer distance. I think if I was hunting with this piece, I would like to keep the dangerous game at the distance where I would need the flip up rear sight. Getting back to the standard rear sight on this might be a little too close for comfort. We have no markings on the top of the barrel flat here, apart from the markings we saw on the breech area. Half an inch or so from the muzzle, we do have a silver blade front sight that has been dovetailed into the top barrel flat. 
On our left hand side of the forestock, you can see the heads of our barrel keys and their silver extension plates. These have a simple border engraving all the way around them and are attached to the stock with what look like small nails. I'd like to note here again that our barrel keys are running from the left side to the right side, something very common that we see in English and English inspired arms from the period. Our side plate mortise is left empty so that we can see the beautiful curl and figure in the wood stock. Despite the large size of our lock here on this piece, we just have a single lock bolt at the upper center of the side plate mortise. That single lock bolt is very common for these late era muzzleloaders in general, especially those late era flintlock muzzleloaders. You'll find that many of the percussion era arms adopt the same single lock bolt for their assembly. Traveling back from our mortise, you can see again some of that discoloration in the stock in comparison to our butt stock back here, where our stock is a little bit lighter than it is back here in our butt stock. We have the crest of our butt stock that transitions down into our beautiful English cheek rest here with a little bit of established carving on the underneath, separating the cheek rest on the underside from the rest of our butt stock. Overall, a truly beautiful piece that has some added character being so large and with such an exciting purpose. I'd like to thank the Rock Island Auction Company for giving me the opportunity to share this piece with you here today. If you'd like to learn more about this and many other antique arms, I encourage you to visit the Rock Island Auction Company YouTube channel to learn more. Once again, I'm Ethan. I love muzzle loading. Thank you so much for watching. We'll catch you next time.